this is the last session of the Future of Word, WordPress, AI, the next chapter event. Hi, Joe. Hi, Petya. Um, Great job. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for being with us so far. Uh, thank you for staying with us until the last session. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be a really good one. Uh, I think I met Joe in 2013. He came to WordCamp Sofia, and uh, when he was asked a question, what he likes, like we were doing the speakers video. So uh, we asked everybody, what do you love most about WordPress? And uh, like uh, 13 people interviewed in this video said the community and Joe said, I love coding with WordPress. I really like spaghetti code and I love the challenges that WordPress presents to developers. Well, there we go, <laughs> just bucking the trend. I was, re I remember I was just like watching, I was like, is this guy for real? Like, <laughs> what everybody is complaining about in WordPress. And since then, I've continually been surprised by just like Joe's willingness to just like break boundaries everywhere. It just like goes and digs into the hardest challenges and kind of constantly curious. Uh, he was experimenting with the Rust API uh, and like doing amazing stuff with that when that came about. And now he's been playing with uh, WordPress and AI for um, a while now. I think you came on and demoed some of the stuff that you had built during our last event. And then since then, you've been actually like applying that in practical consulting with like actual clients uh, going in and just like trying to bring out the best that AI can offer to enterprise. Is this what you're going to talk about today? Exactly. Thank you very much for that setup. Yeah. Much appreciated, better job than I would have done. <laughs> All um, right, then. And well, I'm just gonna like you do that. Like as much as I'd like to stay and chat and throw you and like do all those sort of things. Like I love this slide, so I want to see what's next. See you in a bit. All right, thanks, Petya. Hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> appreciate everybody um, showing up. Last session of the day and all of that. Um, it's great to be here. Um, as Petya said, my title slide. This is not meant to be a a portrait or anything, I guess, um, but it is obviously generated with AI. Um, okay, so uh, I, I, as Petch said, I spoke at our last event um, uh, with like um, some more like practical demos and things like that. I'm changing up a little bit this time round to more talk a little bit more broadly about WordPress ecosystem and AI development and um, the kind of hype cycle, I suppose, that it's natural that we're going through. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Philip. Um, okay, so so let's uh, let's let's get stuck in. Um, so the AI hype cycle. Um, this was produced by Gartner in uh, August of this year. Uh, if anybody doesn't know what the the hype cycle is or the Gartner hype cycle, it's kind of a way of plotting over time what the level of expectations for a given technology are and how like over time that those typically always follow the same pattern. Um, and that pattern is something like, uh, you know, there's an innovation trigger, new technology comes out. Um, there's a huge amount of um, hype and expectation around it. And the, the expectations from users go sky high in terms of what people will think it will do for the future. That's the peak of uh, inflated expectations, keyword there being inflated. Invariably, it uh, fails to deliver that level of expectation, and therefore um, there's kind of a trough of disillusionment where maybe the public sentiment changes to that thing was going to take over the world, but it didn't, and it's useless or whatever. Um, but then what happens is there's kind of comes back to an equilibrium where the the value the technology can actually deliver actually starts to meet expectations. And that's eventually called the plateau of productivity, which means uh, people understand the technology well, they know how to apply it, what value to get from it, what they should expect from it, things like that. Um, so it's a very good way, I think, of understanding and interpreting the, like, I guess, um, the zeitgeist, the narrative around different technologies. Um, this is this graph here is actually broken down by, um, like, uh, specific technologies within AI. Uh, so, uh, for example, if you look on the far right, you have something like data labeling and annotation or computer vision. Those are things that we probably heard about, like, I don't know, I mean, I think like 10 years ago, at least, like sentiment analysis, things like that, machine learning being applied to those problems. That went through its cycle, and now it's fairly late in that cycle, and it's well understood what it can do, what value it adds, and how to implement, and things like that. Um, 
generative AI, uh, Gartner have this at the peak of expectations and really the inflated expectations. And therefore, naturally, there would be a fairly strong dip after that. So that could be something like uh, maybe a few months ago, you know, people trying chat GPT for the first time. They're thinking, OK, this is going to take over the world. I'm just going to be able to tell chat GPT how to run my life and it's just going to do everything for me. That's the level of, I would say, like, you know, fever pitch that we were probably at. I actually think, you know, I, I would put us a little bit on the way down from that curve of user expectations where we're kind of on on the, um, uh, you know, getting into the, the um, trough of disillusionment to some degree. But again, it's not, this certainly isn't a, this isn't a value curve of like how good is AI or not. It's just really about the expectations that people have on it and what kind of the sentiment is. Um, so it's a cycle that you need to go through that's fairly healthy to go through. And ultimately, um, once you kind of reach that slope of enlightenment, it's a good time to be applying these tools and you know understanding well what they do. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to this, but that's kind of the, the concept anyway. Um, just to support maybe my idea that we might be over that peak a little bit of user expectations. There's also recent data around how maybe ChatGPT's usage is declining a little bit. Maybe it's the same for some of the other AI um, uh, like consumer tools. So maybe we're over that peak of, of user expectation as people, you know, um, start to understand when that sh this can and can't be applied and, and that kind of thing. Um, so that's the data from similar web um, of uh, last month as well about um, uh, understanding that kind of trend. Um, so I wanted to talk a little about, you know, over, over the past, I would say, um, four or five months, we've been talking to a good amount of organizations around their adoption of AI and how to integrate it into uh, you know, specifically WordPress solutions, but also other solutions as well. And there's a few themes that have, I guess, emerged from those conversations. Um, the first one is around uh, like the data ownership or privacy and compliance. Like there's just the, okay, well, there's vendor compliance for like enterprises is generally a large and difficult thing. Uh, but then there's also, uh, the kind of privacy angle of like, are we allowed to send the data that we have to somebody like um, OpenAI? And do we also want to be training their models with our data? Maybe that data will show up in a future version of ChatGPT, those kind of um, issues. So uh, like better adoption, basically, OpenAI Enterprise was released a few months ago, along with, uh, I think, Enterprise Chat GPT, maybe in, in conjunction with Microsoft. Um, now you can self-host more models yourself, like Llama and things like that. So that's another way to, to get around that. Microsoft Azure OpenAI recently provided like legal guarantees for copyright claims and things like that for content. So clearly the providers are catching up when it comes to being able to like provide um, production ready type, um, uh, I guess, implementations or services that, that was making it difficult for organizations to adopt. Um, the second one is around quality tone and maybe the knowledge the understanding of enterprise uh, and enterprises data that, that large language models would typically have. Um, so that could be like, um, uh, you know, not, not having expertise around the topic of a given organization, their products and things like that. There's definitely been some good advancements there. Um, GPT 3.5 and 4, you can now fine tune, for example, with specific data and change tone and things like that. Um, quality is improving. And I'll talk a little bit later about other techniques maybe to increase the, the quality um, that, that you can get from, from models. And then uh, I've definitely had several conversations around like, a bit of a paralysis about getting started with AI because there's big questions around what a if AI is going to be an organization's core competency, what level of intellectual property they want to develop around it, that kind of thing. And those very large questions end up ultimately being a blocker to really doing anything. Um, so I would say uh, I, I don't necessarily have a solution for that one other than I would definitely recommend um, organizations try and dip their foot in and, and experiment with things or roll small things out to production, try different vendors, things like that. I think trying to make all of those decisions up ahead of time is probably going to leave you um, in a lagging position and in a position of, of paralysis for longer than you probably want. 
Um, okay, so uh, I, I want to talk now a little bit about like different solution areas that we're seeing emerge again through conversations and projects that we've had with um, our clients, but also just understanding a little bit of where the ecosystem is in terms of AI solutions integrated into WordPress. Um, I tried to lay out a bit of a spectrum here between like, yes, AI can do that, no worries, it's ready to go. And like, you're gonna need to do quite a lot of R&D and like um, uh, design work and uh, uh, engineering ultimately to deploy things. So that's kind of the way that I'm gonna go through this. Um, so, the, you know, easiest, most obvious thing, for example, is like summarization. The task of summarization, large language models, great at that. They don't really have hallucination problems. Um, you can just kind of, you can put it into production very easily. You could probably deploy something in a week. This is doing things like, okay, I'll write my post excerpt or I'll write my tweets or whatever, that kind of stuff, right? You've got your document text, you need to condense it down for some reason, maybe a lot of the SEO type stuff or our meta descriptions and all of that. It's very reliable, it's very easy to do. Um, and you, know, you can really pick from a lot of different models and things like that, and you're gonna get good results. Um, secondly, things around data labeling as well. If you think back to the Gartner hype cycle chart that I put with like um, the uh, data labeling and categorization, like really on close to that plateau of productivity, it's very well established technology. Um, it can do things like categorization, sentiment analysis of content, um, maybe not safe for work detection on content, that kind of thing. This is, you know, it, it works, it works well. It's fairly easy to adopt, fairly easy to integrate. It's an API call away and you can enrich ultimately content and it, it suits the CMS well as uh, the CMS well, because you have all of this structured data in the CMS, you can enrich it easily with these kind of uh, AI applications. Um, so that's to some degree, that's kind of where it ends, I would say, in terms of what you can just push into production today. Um, and it's, it's going to work, it's going to be accurate enough, that kind of thing. So I want to kind of push probably a little bit beyond that in terms of um, projects that we're working on with clients and um, I guess approaches uh, that are, I would say, a little less turnkey in terms of uh, how they can be applied. Um, so certainly what, what we're seeing actually in practice um, is putting a single AI service or model into production is difficult. Um, they demo great, uh, but as I say, there are kind of quality issues. There's maybe um, the, uh, there's, there's domain issues of in, in, in terms of not knowing the subject well enough and things like that. So we've had a few projects where taking like a composite approach to use multiple either models that provide uh, like competing functionality or different AI services and combining them together. I think that's how you can get from like a, an 80% accuracy or maybe an 80% accuracy is good enough for a demo, but for production purposes, you want like 95 to probably 99 level accuracy and you can achieve that if you combine different models so it could be um, taking the output of one model and feeding it into another it could be using different types of services it could be you know um, uh, taking two and then you're just like using traditional uh, engineering practices to combine them and that kind of thing but ultimately um, taking a composite approach I think is required right now to actually again I'm, I'm talking about uh, enterprises and large organizations putting stuff live that is probably a higher bar than um, a lot of the more kind of like, I would say consumer level adoption of, of this tech has. Um, what that also means is when you're uh, like working out who your AI vendors might be or what models or training you're doing and things like that, I would definitely recommend against investing in like a single AI vendor or something like that, because you're not going to be able to have this kind of composite um, approach that allows you to uh, kind of have a best in breed kind of type selection. And from projects that we've worked on, where we're already um, seeing the value of tying together several um, uh, AI services into a single task, ultimately. So kind of expanding a little bit beyond that, and I think we're definitely getting into to, uh, a little more future looking versus what people are putting into production now, but, but already I can see this emerging in work that we're doing. 
Um, once ultimately we have a concept of like a, a task that an AI can perform, maybe the task is like, I don't know, uh, writing tweets or something like that for content. That task itself may be backed by several AI services or, or, or a combination of AI services and like traditional development. Um, as you build up these different tasks that you ultimately can um, use as kind of in a more modular kind of way, um, a, a, a really interesting thing that I think you can do that's really been enabled by um, OpenAI's function calling API is start to combine those tasks and kind of do mashups and things like that. So it's a little bit like um, if you think like ChatGPT, when ChatGPT added plugins, you can ask uh, the LLM, you know, book me a holiday next week in um, uh, the Canaries, let's say, it will be able to use the kayak api to book you flights on kayak and then use the booking.com api to book you things there and then combine those and, and that kind of thing so that's kind of an orchestration kind of problem um and uh i i, I still believe that it's a little bit um undervalued underappreciated right now open ai recently uh released capabilities to be able to do this kind of orchestration via their function calling api uh so if if um, organizations are kind of building up a, a library of tasks, if you like, that can com can be completed by AI, this is kind of another level that will then allow you to combine, and that gives you kind of a multi multiplicative effect, apologies for that, uh, on you know the different solutions that you can therefore have built. And exactly what the interfaces are, that and things depends, but um, I think that's a key breakthrough. And uh, again, things that we're already working on, which is, um breaking apart a bit the kind of like okay you're not just going to say to an ai build me a new website it's it's going to need to be broken down more that with like engineering stuck in the middle of that process um and this seems to be the emergent pattern in terms of how you could probably achieve that it's a little bit similar to like the multi-agent systems in ai concept but that's more around like autonomous agents working towards goals, whereas I'm talking about something a little more traditional here in terms of like uh, the the coding and engineering involved to build systems that can work this way. Um, but I think it 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 shows a future of, um, I guess, uh, building blocks and then for emergent solutions and behavior based off of that with something like WordPress at the core of it. Um, that that hopefully that isn't too abstract uh, for everybody watching. Um, but that, that kind of gets onto this next, I guess, concept, but application of AI that I think is a really important one. And, and Noel Tok, our CGO, um, uh, I, I don't know if he coined this term or not, but um, like the idea of hidden AI and what I, what I mean that, and I think what he means by it is like, it, it's invisibly used. So maybe you're building a solution for something. Um, Maybe you know you want to I don't know build uh, image editor or something like that. Um, by using uh, AI as kind of part of your tool belt to do that, the feature itself isn't AI. Um, the solution that you build, hopefully, you just build it quicker and it's a better quality solution because you have this additional capability. So I'd say up to this point, most of the AI adoption that we've seen, you know, in in WordPress and plugins and things is a fairly literal transposition of AI features, right? Put ChatGPT in your dashboard or like have a uh, AI writer or something like that, right? They're very um, uh, direct, I suppose, applications of that technology. Um, but the more that you were to embed um, AI knowledge into product teams, development teams, product owners, things like that, the more that it can start to be used as a general tool. And then you're kind of just uh, back to the world of you know, products and solutions and building experiences, but you have this other whole capability that can really get you there quicker and better. Um, so that's, uh, I think, again, a little further down the line, I don't see organizations thinking probably in that mindset yet and development teams thinking in that mindset. Um, but that's definitely something that that I'm trying to encourage across our team and conversations that I have and, and things like that. So finally, um, the I, I'd say what appears to be at the moment the most kind of furthest out, um, uh, you know, 
solution that I see is around user experiences. Most of the stuff that I've talked about so far, and I think most of the stuff that we've seen today is around like the CMS and it's like the user that is the editor or the author or the site admin and how they can use AI in WordPress. And it, it's great to see all of the uh, innovation happening there and that, you know, I have a bit of progression here from like AI point features like, you know, maybe uh, uh, AI assistant in Gutenberg or something um, to hidden AI, maybe orchestration and then whatever's next there in the CMS. And that's where I'm, I'm very excited about what the future of like WordPress as an interface is if AI is a first class tool within that. Um, but we're still talking really about like how the CMS allows you to be more productive to create experiences for users. On the user experience side, um, Things seem to be lagging for one reason or another. I think maybe it's because it hasn't become embedded as much into product teams yet that generally build user experiences. So the how, how is the user experience of the website, of the web application, of the mobile application, or what have you, how is that changing because of AI and how is it taking advantage of capabilities um, of generative content and even machine learning and things like that? Um, so uh, that, that's where I've got a lot of question marks on this chart because I feel like we're much early on the path there, but I feel like there is a transformation that is is certainly due and, and uh, um, is going to happen. Um, so that could be something, um, you know, like... Uh, let's say you're building a train booking website or something like that, right? For the user, like it's a traditional experience, which are this, which is like enter your dates to and from, you know, you, you click search, click back, you search again for a different date, whatever. If you think about that user experience or what the user is trying to achieve and you have AI in your tool about the things that you can apply, um, I think you come up with quite a different experience. And I think that um, though, you know, WordPress it is a CMS, it's ultimately for powering user experiences. And I think that is a, a very kind of uh, key part. And um, that's one area where I would say I'm very keen to have conversations around it, but but, but the reality is I don't feel like um, that is where we are really at at the moment in terms of where the conversation is and where the innovation is happening and things like that. So in summary, uh, the hype cycle is real. It's natural, I think, that we have a um, uh, kind of a period of inflated expectations. Um, then there will naturally be a kind of drop off of that and skepticism around it. And then it kind of balances and comes to an equilibrium where people understand how best to apply these tools. And AI isn't, AI isn't a single tool, right? It's lots of different tools that are all at different points along this kind of cycle of adoption and expectations and, and value that people can derive from it. Um, most, most recently, it's, it's probably around LLMs, but even the things that LLMs can do is really varied. Uh, LLMs are not just for writing text. They can do a lot of other things, but it's, it's again, it surprises me how much of that is just still feels like it's being discovered. Um, the challenges to adoption, I think, are surmountable. I did outline some of those, and that's just getting better and better. I think the more that organizations can share how they're approaching AI, adopting it, that kind of thing, I feel like as a whole uh, community, that, that helps everybody kind of get more comfortable and, and uh, uh, you know, using these tools. Um, and solutions that add value are already available i you know when, when i talked about solutions in the initial half i would say those are really things that you can do right now um but also the future looks very bright and there's a lot of innovation i think um still ahead of us absolutely uh and um it's going to take probably more engineering work to get there but i feel like the more interesting use cases are still way ahead of us um i'd say you know we're only a few percent, maybe, you know, five to 10% in that journey of like, what can we actually deploy and what will actually deliver value? Um, so yeah, I guess until next time on where we can see uh, we're further along on that journey. Um, like I said, I'd, I'd like to like encourage the community and organizations to share their experiences, challenges, solutions, that kind of thing. I love talking to uh, companies about what they're doing and the challenges they're seeing and things like that. 
it's it's a thing that we do a lot of um, at, at Human Made as well. Um, and uh, I feel like that's how we can drive the field forward: is we have to share what we're doing. That's why we put on events like these to 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 kind of bring everyone together and share the common ideas and things like that. What is working? What isn't working? Um, and we don't have to, uh, you know, hold our cards too too tightly to our chest and and all of that. Um, yeah, that's that's what I've got. Petcha, welcome back. Hello. Uh, did I unmute? Okay. Yes, I did. You did. You did. I mean, technology is being challenging for me for the last four hours. Uh, mm -hmm. Luckily, uh, not so much for you, uh, which is the important bit. <laughs> anyway, we have several questions uh, in a, a very uh, amazing kind of turn of events. Ryan found the Q&A box. Uh, but John has been as asking uh, Excuse me. Questions, just like last session, so I'm going to start with one of his. Um, don't you think businesses are overestimating the immediate applicability of generative AI due to hype? Uh, yes, I definitely do. Um, that I, I would put something like, you know, thinking, um, oh, AI is now just going to write all of our content for us and we're going to like, you know, publish huge amounts of that kind of thing. So I feel like that is overestimated. I feel like it's also severely underestimated of what the more, like I say, kind of hidden AI application is and the things, the solutions that you can build and achieve. So uh, I guess the, the key point in John's question, I feel like, is the immediate applicability. Absolutely, yes. I think the, the immediate obvious things are probably always overhyped and over um, kind of estimated and expectations are high. But I think if in five years you say that, then it's, it's probably going to be different, right? It didn't do what we thought it was going to do, but it ended up adding loads of value in here instead. So many technologies have that kind of pattern too. Right. Cool. Um, a question from Steve McNally. Uh, where, oh, during this, let's start answering. Where are you seeing effective orchestration happening? For example, who's doing good work with uh, the logic to split tasks across various users? Um, yeah, so I, I'd say there's a couple of areas to this. One is, I think, completing the same, like a given task using a bunch of AI services. That is something that we are doing in projects that we have. So um, that could be uh, like one example of that is like um, maybe taking data labeling and combining it with summarization or something like that, just to take a, similar, a simple example, right? Where really the engineering that you have to do there is quite basic, make a bunch of API calls, feed it through something like an LLM to combine all of that stuff together in a very fuzzy way, because you probably want kind of a natural result. That's how you can do that. Um, the higher level kind of, um, okay, my AI can perform 15 different tasks of different types of things, but how can I now, you know, talk to my, uh, talk to my computer in a more natural way and do all of those things, have a combination of those things. I don't think that um, anybody's doing that in production right now. Again, we have got some experiments around doing that. Like I said, using, OpenAI's function calling API, I feel like it's a bit of an unsung hero in terms of how you are able to do things like that. Um, so, but but I feel like, yeah, that's that's still a ways out. Okay, thanks. Um, have you had uh, another question from John? Conversations with organizations to weigh the benefits of generative AI against the uncertainties related to data ownership. Um, and IP and the accuracy of outputs generated? Mm. I'd say not specifically conversations around like a cost benefit. I, I haven't had anything like that, which is like, okay, we'll use it if it's really good, and then we'd be willing to like, you know, uh, give up on the accuracy thing or something, or, or, or the, uh, the data ownership side. Different organizations are concerned about those things to different degrees. Um, and uh, I think they have different priorities. Um, some organizations are uh, just, I don't know, I guess culturally more conservative um, and therefore their top priority is gonna be around data ownership. Um, whereas maybe uh, like publishing or something might be more geared towards like, okay, accuracy has gotta be really strong there. Um, and again, that depends what kind of publishing house it is and all of that. So definitely different priorities. I haven't had any uh, conversations where like weighing up, is it good enough to be kind of, you know, uh, uh, flouting some other concerns that we have. Right. Uh, I'm going to ask one last one from John and then we're going to wrap up. 
with the last question. So as raised in other presentations, without a standardization of API access to various LLM models, isn't building with multiple LLMs going to be costly? Um, honestly, I would say not really, because it's quite easy to call different LLMs. I mean, if I guess if you're self-hosting LLMs, that is definitely a little bit more complex. If you were to take like, you know, um, Anthropic and OpenAI and, and uh, Bard or something like that, very easy in the grand scheme of things just to write the different code to interface with those things. There are some projects already around abstracting away from those things. So it's like use this one library, get access to 20 LLMs. That's kind of already a thing that happens. Um, I'm not really a, just my general approach in, in engineering is not really one to go abstract before you actually need to. Um, so I'm kind of still just, you know, we're just doing things, I would say a little bit more um, directly than taking that approach right now. Um, it, the problem with standardization of, of any API is innovation then is kind of difficult to adopt because somebody's going to come up with an LLM that allows you to do something else, right? Like you can somehow feed in knowledge into the LLM in a different kind of way. Okay, well, now that's not going to fall into a standardization of an API. Um, so that's why I feel like in a very fast moving technology, quite difficult to get that type of standardization. There's all kind of incentives around the companies of why they don't want to be you know, commit themselves to standardization at this point. That's more of like a, I don't know, a kind of commoditization kind of step, I think, to do that. Um, but it's not something that I'm too worried about right now. In that way. Okay. I hope that you are uh, satisfied with those answers. One last question, and then we can wrap up. Um, Ryan asks, are there any emerging technologies early on the hype cycle we should be paying attention to? Hmm, that's a good question because, um, yeah, we're we're all like riding the wave to some degree of generative AI and LLMs, um, and it's like, oof, what's next? You know, does anybody have energy for what's next? I think the multi-agent um, uh, AI stuff is is very interesting. The the idea of autonomy around agents, though. <laughs> somewhat frightening at the same time, uh, correctly deployed um, is, is where I'm looking next, really, in terms of at the moment we have uh, AI services that can, you know, you ask them something, they give you a response back. They don't really do anything. I think the doing is probably the interesting next thing. Um, and no doubt, once, you know, the, the reason why they are probably early on that hype cycle is because there's not a demonstration, a strong demonstration of capability yet. As soon as there is, and somebody releases a product where you can actually, you know, have the agent go and do something for you, it's just going to like shoot up the hype cycle. And then obviously it's going to be like, again, it's going to be, oh, our lives are over. You know, there's, you know, we don't have to do anything anymore. And then there'll be a period of disillusionment after that, when it turns out it screws up a load of stuff and it doesn't always work and you can't get it to do what you hope you want to do. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's the cycle. I'm going to have a repeat of the chat GPT experience, right? Like, I mean, yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> the, whole, the whole world. Of yeah. um, thank you, Joe. Um, I think this has been great. Thank you so much for hosting all day. Very on your toes with all of the, uh, yeah, it's been my absolute... directions. Um, I'm actually like, let's just close it off. I think we're done. Uh, we had such amazing, I mean, more than four hours. Uh, because uh, our first session, uh, kind of, I, I, I just couldn't stop those guys. Like, one, <laughs> one well, I'm sure impressive. plenty of people wanted to hear from Matt's to. thoughts on the like topic. That, yeah, but that's the thing. <laughs> they didn't want to. They, they got yeah, exactly. Really, exactly. really interesting matter right there, and it kind of felt like a crime, just like jumping in. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they looked. I don't know if you watched the session, but uh, they. Kind I did. Of, I did. Like, they looked like kids in a toy store. Like they were just like <laughs> sparkling, you know, they were just like bouncing off each other. It's like talking about like, what's next and what are we going to do? The, the tough job of the moderator. That's what you've yeah. got, but, yeah. It was really great though. And it's like a good example of how sessions here can just like overlap from like a very broad kind of topics to, you know, examples like the ones Jamie did and like, like you did, uh, where people would be like, I can't yeah. do it. Possible. Yeah, I think we've we've had such a spectrum of different, like uh, high level, low level, different topics, like 
uh, some very close to WordPress, some further away. Like I've really liked, I've, I've watched all the sessions and I really like the different like vantage points and perspectives and, and all of that. I think, you know, last event we went, it was a little more linear in terms of like a lot of different product demos of what are people doing in, you know, in the WordPress admin right now. And I was really happy with how we were able to like, uh, yeah, you know, uh, broaden things out a little bit here and, uh, you know, get some different perspectives. Yeah, I think so too. Um, and I'm really glad I was kind of uh, a part of that. You know? very close proximity. What were, what do you think, like what were your biggest takeaways? What's the, what are you thinking about? The, the, I can see that the space is already maturing quite a lot, even from three months ago. And that's really great to see. I think the type of work that we're most involved in is with like larger organizations where there needs to be a higher level of, of kind of like maturity and things like that. So. That's what I also have a vested interest in seeing. Um, it, it's definitely, it's calmer now. Um, and it's good to see really uh, both that um, this, this, there's still a huge amount of innovation to happen, but it's also great to see people shipping stuff and like filtering through to products and things like that. So that's my kind of takeaway is like we we're moving forward and you know my my talk was on the hype cycle there right? we're moving through that and that is a good thing that, that that is happening so um i think yeah it's kind of you know we're off to the races now and uh, you know we we keep riding that cycle it's hard kind of to think of tech innovation that is as in, in impactful and transformative as artificial intelligence and it's like even crazier to think like this is this is just now starting like it's uh it's it's in the beginning we're in the beginning of like yeah yeah makes you wonder what's next um, <laughs> what do you think about uh jamie's predictions did you watch those they were uh i did yeah but you have to refresh my memory yeah, i don't remember how punchy they were three uh and i i'd love to hear what you thought in the chat as well so he made three he said first the ai battle will move closer to where the customer first interacts with WordPress mm. in companies will become much more powerful and kind of bringing in customers uh, and um, we'll see them have like constant focus on AI. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's definitely true. He did say hosting companies weren't product companies, which I feel like. Yeah, yeah. yeah he did. Dig at hosting companies. <laughs> no, um, I mean, it's, it's definitely true. I think for consumers, hosting is generally the first point of contact. Yeah. Um, that's not necessarily the case for kind of people that we work with, um, but uh, th th this is why this is a thing for us as well, right? Is because again, it's it's bringing the conversation closer to to the user. Um, at what point does AI become just so expected and background that yes, the person closest to the customer is doing it, but everybody is doing it; it's expected anyway, so it's no longer kind of a differentiator. Um, maybe that's a further out prediction than what Jamie says. <laughs> <laughs> the second one he did was that AI content will become dynamic and way more intelligent. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I don't know if we've seen much of that yet, but like uh, absolutely going to happen. I feel like the, the cost of uh, generative AI is probably just a little expensive. It's a little bit too slow right now to do, you know, even ahead of time generation and all of that. But again, that's one of those things that like it's going to happen. Do you want it to happen? Will it be good? I don't know. <laughs> um, but is it going know, to threaten everybody's job again? Like, how, <laughs> yeah, how that yeah, yeah. Is that everybody's? You know, again, reading different stuff. I don't. You know, I don't really want. Um, I don't know. But but yes, more 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 dynamic things. I mean, uh, that's the amazing thing with this technology is it feels so much more natural than technology innovations that came before it. It's very human now. There's all of the bias and issues and, you know, personification and anthropomorphization, everything that goes with that. But the reality is it feels <laughs> a lot more easier to do natural things, to write text, to do images. We're going to have like a design. real life, real life Wapu answering our questions about what like, Well, exactly. There we go. Do you, do you actually want that? You know, something that you could do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the third one that he said was very, very interesting, and that's that authentic con uh, the third prediction was that authentic content and brand will become even more important uh, in the mm. era. Mm. That's a bit of a yeah. challenge. 
It will to some people. Again, will it will it be enough to overcome the ninety percent of 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 areas where it's not important? And then you've got loads of generated content. You've got like nobody's actually written anything that you're reading. You kind of lose the human touch, or half the time you're fooled into it. It's going to be really interesting to see. Okay. Yeah, how how does it play out? To con do I mean not not to talk about this in such a kind of um, uh, economic kind of sense, but like do do people like revolt against that idea and therefore yeah authenticity is super valuable or is there like five percent of people who, who for them it's really value but nobody else really cares and then we're just kind of like a washing in authentic content you know i don't actually know yeah true well authenticity is going to become i mean how do you how do you even understand and find out if something is authentic maybe that's like what the next step yeah yeah well uh, that gets into this whole area around what do they call it like um uh, digital watermarking and things like that, right? So you know what stuff has been generated and what hasn't. It's a whole area. <laughs> well, uh, maybe imperfect things um, become... Yeah, 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 no, they're the valuable ones. Yeah. That's with AI art now, that's certainly the case. I mean, you look at AI and you can instantly tell because it's all too perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Looks out I remember your title slides. Uh, it was... <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, yeah. this has been really great, Joe. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Petya. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, content uh, out of this event is going to be coming to our social channels in the next week. We are going to continue kind of pushing the boundaries of AI with our customers. Uh, and if you have any stories to share, uh, please reach out. I'm sure that there is going to be a next chapter of this event pretty soon. Thank you so much for your kind comments. Please send us uh, your feedback and I hope to see you all very soon. Have a good evening, Joe, and- uh, Thank you, you too, Petya. Bye. Bye.